so here is the next fireside chat with Jan Hegewald from Zalando. Welcome, Hello. Jan. Hello, thanks for having me. So you adjusted your background image to our fireside chat. That is great. That is a cozy environment. It's way more cozy than our uh, white background here. Yes, of course. I mean, you marketed this talk as a fireside chat and you should not let your customers down. So <laughs> I thought it's a good opportunity if we do it virtually anyway, right? So you're very customer focused at Zalando. I, I get it immediately. So that is great. <laughs> yeah. uh, so we want to talk about um, your move from um, OKRs to another way of measuring uh, your initiatives at Zalando. So for me, it's fascinating when we uh, prepared for this interview, uh, when you described that you really question your approaches all the time. Because uh, two years ago or so, I interviewed another product leader from Zalando. And at that time, it was everything about OKRs, radical agility. So, And now you uh, told me that uh, you do things different now at Zalando. And that's very interesting. And we will dive uh, deep into that uh, in a minute. But before we do that, could you give us a short introduction uh, to yourself? That would be great. Yeah, sure. My name is Jan. Um, from my background, uh, it's, I guess, very traditional. So I studied computer sciences. And while doing that, and also afterwards, when I started my professional uh, work life, um, I uh, did uh, custom software development for big clients uh, with a company called Capgemini for, for nine years. Um, so I know the software engineering uh, mechanics inside out, so to say, uh, from that time. Afterwards, I was responsible for a small team of engineers uh, within Campana and Shot, and this was also yeah engineers as well, but we were more fo more focusing on uh, project, program, and portfolio management methodology and supporting tools. And it was that time when the agile methodologies uh, became increasingly popular, um, and and the first attempts around that uh, could be seen in the wild, so to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and after that, I uh, then switched to to e-commerce. Uh, so I joined uh, Idealo and worked with them for four years as a head of technology for, for uh, business operations and B2B. And then in B2B, um, for example, we took care of integrating the hundred thousands of uh, sellers that are uh, on the e-commerce market with the price comparison platform. And now, uh, quite precisely three years ago, I joined Zalando. Ah, yeah, cool. Very interesting. So Zalando is always the poster child for German tech companies. So people are always very interested in how Zalando is doing things. And we hear Digital Lloyd as well, of course. Um, for the audience, that they get a little bit of a better um, idea for what kind of products you are responsible at Zalando. So your title is Director of Engineering Product and Category Experience. What does it exactly mean? Yeah. So for me, this means uh, my, my responsibility the responsibility essentially consists of three parts. So first of all, I'm responsible for what we call the product offer platform. It's the Lando's central platform where we combine the product data that we have with the current stock levels of the various merchants or ourselves and uh, the prices into product offers. Then we also do the merchant selection, like choosing which merchant is the one that will become merchant of record and then steering the availability of these offers on the various markets. That's one part, it's roughly a team of 16 people working on that. Um, then secondly, I'm responsible for what we call product experience um, and the engineering thereof. Uh, product experience is essentially the team that is responsible for the product detail page. So the page that you see if you look at one specific product uh, on Zalando and um, yeah, where you can also add it to the bag and so on. And thirdly, I'm also responsible for a team that we newly built this year. Uh, it's called Category Experience. And with that team, we want to de average the, the shopping experience per category. To give you one example, if uh, you're shopping for beauty products on Zalando as well, we do want to do this in a different way than if you look for, uh, for, for fashion, because for fashion, it's relevant what's the material, what's the size, and so on. And for beauty, it's more of a relevance what's, uh, for example, your skin type if you're looking for skincare products. And so, uh, yeah, so the, the second team, the, the product experience, the one in the middle, uh, consists of roughly 38 people all over. And this category experience team that is newly built consists of roughly 12 people currently. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, and um, the team, uh, which roles are in the team? So you said now the, the amount of people who are in the, in the teams. So what kind of skills do they have? Mm -hmm. 
That varies. So if we look at the product of a platform again, this is rather a back-endish data processing platform, right? So mainly we do have product managers, of course, in there, um, and then mainly backend engineers. Uh, also some analytics support, but but mainly it's backend engineers. If we look to the two other teams, product experience and category experience, these are um, uh, more diverse cross-functional teams. So they consist, uh, first of all, also of uh, UX designers. Um, and of course, also product management, also engineering. Then we also have to differentiate uh, between web and app channels. So we have um, teams for iOS, for Android, and for web. And there's also a, a bigger focus on, on the analytical part. But really, the big difference is, is the focus or the addition of more uh, UX uh, and UI designers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, when, when we started with the talk, and also the title of the talk is about your uh, prioritization processes um, at Salando. So could you tell us a little bit um, about this change uh, from the radical agility term to what you do now? So how, how, how can we understand that? Yeah, as you rightfully said, um, some years ago we were doing uh, quite intensely this, this radical agility, and this radical agility was based on the idea that in order to to work with so many teams, so currently in Zalando we are around 200 delivery teams spread across the three countries. Um, if they want to work on the various parts of the systems independently, they really need to be able to do this uh, with uh, the least uh, dependencies that you can have, being a technical, being an organizational. And so the goal was really to have them uh, work autonomously. Mm -hmm. And we achieved that. And also you need this microservice architecture thingy for that and so on and so forth. And, and we had all that, but uh, what we then encountered is that these teams um, also cross-functional, of course, um, they then start to also work and think locally. So to give you an example, it can mean that you're optimizing your some conversion rate by zero point something percent mm -hmm. or that you're uh, cutting your costs by X percent or something. And while this is cool, and we also need to have this capability to develop these uh, all things uh, in parallel and independently, it becomes hard to do things that cross many teams. And then uh, one thing that we tried to, to, to leverage as a means to implement that was OKRs at that time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, the goal of OKRs is to kind of set alignment across many teams and to work on bigger and bigger things. Um, it didn't work very well with us, um, I think, for many reasons. One reason is that OKRs work so much top down and bottom up that there was always too many of them. So all of the teams had multiple, some they wanted to set themselves, some they uh, got uh, derived from the, uh, the goals that were given uh, from, from the top, some that they were asked to contribute to by other teams that needed something to, to achieve their stuff. And so it was always hard to really do this and execute it. And so um, last year and this year, we've changed to a more uh, flexible process that's also no longer bound to these strict rhythm or cadence that you have with OKRs. Um, but instead, we now have a kind of rolling product um, development process, which is based on a rolling prioritization of what are the big things that we want to do. And they can be, they can be uh, suggested, for example, bottom up. So normally, product managers from any team can come up with a, such a big idea. I mean, one recent example to make it more tangible is we recently launched what we call pre-owned. So this is the ability for you to extend the life of the fashion that you've bought. If you are bored of uh, whatever you have in your wardrobe, you can uh, sell that back to Zalando if it's still in good shape. And then Zalando would resell it to, to other consumers. So it would extend the life of the fashion. It's, it's more sustainable and uh, also gives people the, the ability to also purchase those goods. Um, and you can imagine this is a super complex project because it requires uh, logistics, it requires the experience when you're buying this, it requires uh, implications and, and payments and so on and so forth. And um, so this is the big things that we want to achieve. So we wanted to move away from just lo optimizing locally to uh, also um, yeah, innovating at scale. And, and this is why we came to this uh, overarching um, process. And it's, it's 
it sounds quite complicated, but it's essentially super trivial because it's just applying uh, agile methodologies. It's kind of, you have a backlog and you refine it and you prioritize it. So any product manager can come up with a big idea, like for example, this um, pre-owned fashion. And then we, we go through a process and we determine, is this really a problem worth solving for our customers? Is this really a problem that our customers' life would be easier if we solve it? And um, yeah, then we discuss this and we prioritize it. And then if we think it's something that we would like to do, it really makes a difference for customers. Then we come up with determining then what are the implications? How could the solution look like? What would be the architectural changes required and so on and so forth. And then we align this also with all the affected teams. And when we're through this, then we can decide whether we do it or not. And then mm -hmm. we do it and execute it. And, and the, 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 the beauty of that is uh, this happens so that we do it when we have the capacity to do so. Because something that I also, as I mentioned, also observed with the OKRs is that you can easily have too many of them and then the organization is nevertheless overstretched. And with that, we really start the next thing when we have the capacity to do so. And in the end, we also ask again, is it now ready to be rolled out to customers? Is it good enough? And then we do that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So could you go there a little bit more into the details? You said now a product manager can can come up with an idea and then you do user research, I assume, um, if this is, um, is a solution you should go for. How does this process look concretely and which, um, yeah, which people have the decision at the end to decide if you go for a bigger initiative or not? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's pretty much like you like, like you scratched it right now. Um, so, of course, we start with some insights wherever this might come from. It might be from product manager. Uh, it can come from quantitative uh, user research. It can be from, from big bets. I mean, it's also important that you cannot user research everything, right? Because if there's new things, or you can also not A-B test everything, right? Um, sometimes you have to make what we call big bets. And uh, then we really need to understand what is really the customer needs, what is the, how much, or how big is the customer group that is affected by that? How much is it a problem for them? And this is mainly really work for product managers supported by user researchers and so on, and, and, and all the insights that we gathered on, on the various parts of uh, our company. And yeah, as I said, in, in, in the, the, the decision that I mentioned beforehand, like the, the first one after that would be, is it really a problem worth solving for our customers? This is typically made then, although this, this approach comes bottom up, is made then by top down. So we have, of course, a lot of these ideas. And then the executive round, for example, prioritizes them based on how much it also pays into our strategy, of course. Um, I think it's always a very good prerequisite to have <laughs> to, to kind of have an idea where you want to go in the next years. Um, yeah, and then it goes to, to other people. So the product manager stays, I would say, and, and also continues to work. But then we have more like including principal engineers who look into the technical details, look into the dependencies, also gather some insights into what would be the effort roughly uh, on the long term, and also including already the teams that would need to participate uh, to that solution so that they also are included and can part of, yeah, contribute to the solution design. And then again, it goes to this decision committee, which is the executive round, um, to decide, are we really starting to build this? And do we now have the capacity to do so, uh, having in mind that we have other big initiatives that we are also pursuing at the same time. Mm -hmm. cool. So and uh, who is in this executive round? That's interesting. So what are the roles of people who are there? Is this up to the sea level or who does it? Yeah, indeed, it, it starts so roughly with directors and VPs. They can have various backgrounds. Sometimes they come, typically they come often from in either the engineering um, side or from a commercial side. Um, it can also be from product, of course, and it really indeed goes up to, to the CTO, so to say. And then in that round, it is collectively based on, on all the, the work that has been done decided what's really the biggest impact for our customers and what does fit best to our uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. okay. So um, <clears throat> when you now have um, your initiatives in place and you work on different features, initiatives and so on, um, how you do, the, uh, do you do the KPI tracking of that? Is, is there a, a process in place that you go with your product managers in your teams um, on a weekly basis or bi-weekly basis through KPIs? Is it that way in your team or do you do it differently? No, it's, it's a mixture. Also what I explained now with these big initiatives, they are part of what we're doing. There's still, of course, this, this local 
product management as you know it um, like like historically right so we are still having someone who for example looks after the product detail page uh, by itself not only as being affected by these big initiatives so there is this normal product management work as we all know it uh, happening on an ongoing basis so they all have the their kpis we have like i don't know click through rates conversion rates um uh, page load times and all the stuff in place. And the teams are continuously monitoring this and also revisit this on a regular basis. Um, so this is a place as is quite usual. Um, when we look at these bigger initiatives, um, then it really depends on what is the KPIs that we want to move. Um, we also have some KPI driver tree where we say there's one big KPI that we want to look at as the kind of North Star KPI, which in our case is the customer lifetime value. That is, of course, harder to track because it's delayed. You can measure it only delayed. It uh, only changes uh, with some delay, and it's therefore hard to track back. But we have this driver tree, which really kind of drills down into what sub KPIs drive this top level KPI, and then we monitor what we can monitor and where we can see the effect immediately, for example. Mm -hmm. And also after these big initiatives, we then also uh, afterwards look at um, what has changed, what were the goals, where are we going, and um, then we can derive further actions from that. So we, we could talk <laughs> a long, long time about that. We could dive deeper into this, but we only have a couple of minutes left now for the interview and because we want to also go to question and answers. So I just have uh, one or two questions in another direction. So the role of the product owner. Yeah. Um, do you see something, what changes there? Is this role constant or do you see something happening in this role in your, in your teams? Yeah. So first of all, we don't call them product owners anymore. We call them product managers. And I think there's also a good valid reason to do so. If you look at, for example, Scrum methodology and the role expectation there, I, I'm a little bit exaggerating, but I see it in a way like the product owner is kind of taking care that the backlog is in, is in good shape, technically well formulated and does some prioritization. Um, and then also when the, when the delivery team has uh, implemented a ticket, then uh, that's the uh, final uh, confirmation that everything was fine. Um, I think this is something where we, we moved away quite a bit and still are moving. So what we really see is that product managers take much more responsibility um, like also determining what is really customer problems that are worth solving. When I came to Zalando, I was a little bit surprised. It was very engineering led, I would say. I would say this has now changed it a bit uh, to be more product led, and I think that's good. Um, and the product managers, they really, from my perspective, their their kind of work was elevated. So they are no longer. They, they are of course also looking. There are some especially more junior ones, for example, that are looking at this local stuff and, and taking care that, for example, the PDP itself performs well. And then there's a growth path for them to extend the domain that they work on and, and really think about in these in these bigger scopes. Um, yesterday, there was this great talk by Curtis uh, about uh, explaining product management in six diagrams. And if you remember, there was one diagram about the level of knowledge the product manager has, and it was like essentially in your team, the level of knowledge is high, and uh, the further you get away from that, the, the lower is the level. I think this is perfectly true, and it's also a problem because this hinders you as an organization to really work and come up with big problems. And this is why we also elevate product managers to have more time to really uh, be engaged in the early discovery phases. It doesn't mean they are not part of the other ones, but also um, in, in some of my departments, for example, also. Uh, the engineers take much more responsibility. So it's not like uh, if you're doing delivery that the product manager needs to answer all the questions of the engineering team, but they do it themselves. So it elevates their responsibility and their way of working, and they can take care of bigger and, and really holistic and trend things. At the same time, it gives the freedom to the product managers to really also take care of, of broader uh, topics and to be more invested in the early discovery phases and coming up with the next big uh, potentially game-changing ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. But you call them now product managers, not product owners anymore. Ah, okay. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, probably the last question from my side. So what does it take to become a product manager yeah. at Salando? So it's probably interesting for a lot of attendees here at the Digital Leute Summit. Yeah, sure. Um, I think two things are kind of essential, uh, but like uh, in every company. So you need to have the, oh no, it's different, I would say. Motivation and desire to learn and grow. Um, I mean, I've been working in very 
excellent companies before. I, I'm, I'm happy to say I, I'm in a very fortunate position. Um, nevertheless, the density of the really excellent people is uh, in Zalando is higher than I've seen anywhere else. And, and so you really also should be motivated and a desire, have a desire to learn and grow. And that's a perfect um, environment then. Um, and then, of course, cultural fit and agile mindset. When it comes to specifically product managers, I would say um, you need to have also the customer mindset. So always thinking from the customer's end um, and thinking about things that make a difference for customers. I think it's easily said, and I think it's like everyone can say that, but I, I've not seen so many companies who really do it because also yeah, business partners are super important and we can compromise on customer experience here and there. And we try to avoid that. I'm not saying that we're perfect at that, for sure not. Um, but we really start with a customer mindset. And this has also turned many solutions that we planned for in the past round into something that is more customer centric. And the other thing is you need to be able, we have a principle that's, that is um, flying high and diving deep. So the idea is you need to be able to really elevate, fly high and fly high and dive deep. Okay. So you need to be able to elevate your perspective or the domain that you look at to really broad one. But at the same time, you should also be able to go deep and uh, understand, uh, if needed, uh, what is a very specific problem around that. Um, this comes down to you should be able to do data analysis also yourself, uh, even if you are responsible for something big um, and so on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just starting to think beyond these local scopes that, that product owners were very much attached to. I think this is super interesting uh, and, and, and vital to be a successful product manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. So we could dive a lot deeper into everything here. So um, I would give it now to the audience uh, that we get some questions. Um, so, Victoria, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, we do. So we have two statements, more or less, and two questions here. The first um, thing is, um, TJ wrote, you might be interested to look into mobiusloop.com, outcomes for impact. Maybe this is interesting for you, Jan. Um, Thomas wrote that uh, sometimes a simple change in wording can make a change. So this uh, thing with product owner turning into product manager, he also thinks that it's, um, it, it makes a difference, really. And then we have a question by Rosa. She's asking, is dynamic goals at team level only? It sounds to me that at company level, the strategy is quite defined, but at team level is where the flexibility lies. Yeah, first, thanks for the hints. I, I will look into that. Uh, very nice. And I also agree that mainly always so many questions are just a mindset question. And so uh, also our wording frames our mindset. So I definitely agree. Um, these flexible goals, I would call them not necessarily flexible goals because they are defined, right? It's more like we don't have a, a static process. We have a kind of rolling uh, process for goals. And they start from indeed uh, from from the also the company level. Like, like I explained this example of um, these pre-owned items or pre-owned fashion. Um, that was something that was uh, set and that really affected, I don't know how many, but definitely a two-digit number of, of teams. And um, yeah, this was set in there. Um, and nevertheless, it's right, there is the flexibility in the team. So this is also, it might sound a little bit uh, like waterfallish, what I described earlier on, this process of, of having these kind of, also you could call it stage gates if you want to. It's not that like that. It's really more making sure that we work on the right stuff. And then we have the freedom in the teams to really implement that in the best way, uh, in the most efficient way and figure that out. And indeed, we also had to learn, I, I, it would be another talk by its own, uh, but uh, what uh, we also did in, in some of my teams is we moved away from these classical engineering component teams where one team is responsible for like component A, B, and C. And we now form them also around these business goals. So if we have these business goals, then we kind of uh, make a pitch from product side to rewards the engineers, what's the goals, what is roughly the scope, and then engineers can say where they would like to work on. And then we form a team, of course, based on the needs that are required, like the skills and, and so on. Um, and a team that works on, on that scope uh, enough end to end, end to end within the department, not really end to end. We're not there yet, unfortunately, but maybe we get there. Um, but really we make sure that the team flexibly uh, adapts to this goal uh, instead of uh, having situations that we had in the past where maybe multiple goals focus on some same components. And then this meant that this one team was super overloaded and other teams were not that busy. Um, so we rather adapt now the, the team structures to the things that we want to achieve 
uh, rather than picking things that could fit to the team structure that we currently have. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so we have more time left. Um, we should go for more questions from, from the audience. Yeah, maybe one last question. Um, how autonomous are the teams at Zalando really? Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, when we did this radical agility, it was pretty extreme. We did a counting of, uh, I think, a year ago or something of the uh, program languages that are in use in Zalando. And the result is astonishing as the result was that it was 43. You could now argue that it's exactly one too much, but you could also argue that it's maybe some more too much. Um, but this was really the result of um, the teams were totally free to choose what technology they work on. And sometimes also it was like, yeah, yeah, we set our own OKRs like this mindset. Um, and we really kind of try to move away a little bit from this mindset. So the teams still are free and autonomous in, and they run their, 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 their services and they're responsible for it. Or even if we have these flexible teams that I mentioned before, so there's nevertheless a scope of what uh, the, the whole department then um, owns and has to operate. Um, but what we need as a shift in mindset is taking pride of also contributing to something that is bigger than, than what was invented in your um, team context, for example, or bigger than your premise or whatever you operate on and taking the pride of that. And uh, I think we've become rather, I mean, we're in this transition and I, I think we were quite successfully doing this. Of course, it's also not frictionless, but, but the teams really understand that their contribution to something much bigger which leaves not so many room of freedom or degrees of freedom in, in the big picture, but in, in their remit still. Um, uh, but contributing to this uh, is something that you can also be very proud of. And it, it turns out they also are. So this works for us quite well. And uh, nevertheless, there's a lot of freedom in how they implement it themselves, how they do technology decisions and so on. But it's, it's, it's getting, uh, we're moving away from one extreme more towards a healthy middle, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems, uh, it sounds like a really balanced approach. Um, Jan, thank you very much that you took the time to join our community here and to share your insights uh, from Salando. It was a pleasure to talk to you and hopefully we see us next year um, in person again. That would be great. Um, yeah, would be happy. It was my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Jan, thank you very much.